Peter. Uh, Peter and I have known each other for quite some time um, from Nigeria and from the tech ecosystem. I'd love you to share a little bit of your journey as an entrepreneur um, with Twiga and a little bit more of your background across the continent, both in Nigeria and Kenya. Thank you so much, uh, Lexi, and uh, great to see you after, after many months. Um, just to give context, I'm a Kenyan, uh, married with uh, uh, four kids. I live out in uh, Nairobi. And uh, from a career standpoint, I worked with Coca-Cola for 21 years. And in those 21 years, uh, for six years, I led the business in the west coast, the east coast of the continent, that's uh, East Af Eastern Africa, from uh, Eritrea all the way to uh, Mozambique. And uh, for the last uh, journey uh, in, uh, in my career with Coca-Cola, I was president for Western Central Africa, and I was based out in uh, Lagos, Nigeria. So, um, and uh, the good thing is that, you know, that journey gave me a front row seat to uh, the structure of retail across uh, the continent, which is very, very similar. The challenges are very, very similar. You will have nuances in each market. And uh, from that, I then uh, took on as a CEO for uh, Twiga in April of uh, last year. But I co-founded Twiga six years ago. And uh, my co-founder, Grant, was running the business on a full-time basis. But I transitioned to full-time uh, in Twiga um, last year, and uh, and it's been an amazing journey up until this point, and I'm happy to share a little bit more about the journey that we've walked and uh, and some of the challenges that uh, we've had to face, and also how we see the future, especially during this period of COVID and the uncertainty around it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you said, you've operated across the continent in two very different markets, but two of the largest markets on the continent. Uh, do you think that these these markets can really be integrated? Can a can a business really integrate into one market across the continent? Um, and and what are some of the different dynamics you've seen? Uh, what is what is more difficult? What is easier? What are some of the barriers? What are some of the things that you think each market is blessed with that the other is not? Thanks, Lexi, for that. So I think the key thing is that when you look at Africa, I don't think you need to look at Africa as countries because even within countries, there's very, very distinct uh, uh, differences between the cities. Just to give you an example, in Nigeria, you know, starting your business in Kano is very different from starting your business in Lagos or even from uh, Port Harcourt to Ibadan. So there's all these uh, nuances around cities. And the way we see or the way I see uh, Africa, Africa is about the cities because about 60% of GDP is actually concentrated in the major cities. And uh, if you look at East Africa, it's places like Nairobi, uh, Kampala, Dar es Salaam, uh, and then you also have the major cities. Um, and, and the key thing is that there's uh, distinct differences, I think, about, uh, there's, I think, four lenses that we normally wear when we're looking at uh, the, the differences in these uh, cities. And I think the first thing is regulatory. Uh, and what you will find is that, you know, although the market structure might look very, very similar, although the opportunity might look very, very similar, what you'll find is that from a regulatory standpoint, everything will be nuanced from maybe what the, the regional governments do in terms of uh, when you're sourcing product or some of the levies that you have with the municipalities. So all those regulations are very, very different. And I think understanding them is very, very important because they have a significant impact on uh, the value chain or the feasibility of uh, your value chain. The second piece is the, what I call the ease of doing business, which also varies across uh, different markets. For example, in some markets like uh, Kigali, you can walk in today, register a business, and by end of day, you'll be able to operate. In some markets, that will take you three months. You know, in some markets, you can register a business, but then there's also a myriad of licenses that you need to acquire. So what you find is that in terms of doing businesses, I think a lot of, uh, there's a lot of differences, not just within countries, but within cities. The third piece that is a huge uh, uh, difference is around uh, infrastructure development. And what I mean by this is that uh, different countries have taken different paths in terms of how they build an infrastructure and a supporting ecosystem. And that has a different impact to the business. For example, if you look at Kenya, one of the biggest uh, infrastructure supports that we have is mobile money and the way mobile money has developed in this market. 
which is both peer-to-peer, -peer, but also allowing different applications. But if you look at, for example, Nigeria, you also have uh, mobile banking, which is not necessarily mobile money, but more or less tied towards the banks, which means that from an operational standpoint, has a very, very different uh, implication in terms of how you execute compared to maybe uh, Ivory Coast, where it's still very much a peer-to-peer -peer market in terms of mobile money. So understanding how infrastructure has developed across all these markets also has a huge uh, implication. And then the last piece is what I'd call the development of local production versus importation. Uh, that also significantly affects uh, the different value chains that you have in the markets. So for example, when you look at uh, produce uh, in the East African part of it, let's talk about dairy. Dairy, you, you'll find that most of uh, the milk that we sell on our platform is actually local milk, which means that you have cows and there's uh, fresh milk in the market. You get to markets in uh, East Africa, in West Africa, and a lot of it is uh, imported powder milk, which is reconstituted, which has different implications on the value chain. So I think also understanding how much of a local ecosystem you can tap into starts creating very, very uh, significant differences across these markets, which also then impacts how you execute. So that's how I would look at it in terms of uh, just a cross board. Um, thanks for that. Uh, so you've really taken this company on a journey to scaling it from uh, zero to today the company has over 500 employees and further creates another 35,000 jobs um, across truckers, agents, farmers, and other people in the ecosystem. So if you were to, to speak to yourself, the, the you of five years ago, what would you tell yourself? Um, what, what didn't you know when you began scaling this business and, and started on this journey that you know today? Thanks, Lexi. I think it's always easier to look back <laughs> uh, because uh, when you look forward, you know, there's so many dots to join and, and so many dynamics to think through. I would say that uh, there's two big things that... Um, uh, we didn't pay heed to uh, early in the days. And what I'd say is that uh, the first is around uh, what I'd call structured uh, capability building. And what I mean by structured capability building is by thinking about the people that we have in the organization, the type of skills that uh, those people uh, need to acquire to become relevant in the future, and also anticipating some of the challenges that we will face going forward and how we then start building that capability. And what you find is that because of those uh, challenges, uh, Lexi, did we just lose you? Uh, I think the camera just went off on Lexi's side. Oh, hi, Lexi. I lost you there for a bit. So, so what I was saying is that uh, uh, one of the big, big challenges that we face was around uh, capability building because uh, what happened is that as we grew, we realized that, you know, we were, we had been informal about how we build our capability for a very, very long time. So what you find is that uh, the way we had structured uh, our organization, you know, we, we didn't, we've had to look at job descriptions again. We'd have to look at how to grade the jobs again. We'd have to then start thinking about uh, how to provide people with structured uh, career plans within the organization. And this is a huge factor around retention. So, and what, what I think what we did and what many startups do is that you leave that until the very, very tail end, which makes it very, very difficult for you to then uh, uh, attract and retain the right type of talent. Because if you're bringing in more experienced folks into a very, very unstructured environment, then they don't find it very conducive for them to stay on for long. The second piece is also around uh, what I'd call uh, systems. And, um, and I think as we, as we build systems, uh, sometimes uh, we don't uh, think about uh, how you build uh, redundancy for growth. So at times you might find that, you know, as you grow, then uh, you overgrow your systems and it starts straining you in terms of how you execute and you have to then rethink about it again. And that consumes a lot of time and resources. So, and I would say that, you know, those are the two things that, you know, if we were to do it different, I will think about how we build our systems. Uh, and I would also think about uh, how we build capability, especially human resource capability within the organization. Lexi, back to you. Hi, Peter. Sorry, I, I went offline and I couldn't hear anything for a second, but I'm back. 
Um, <coughs> so thank you for that. Um, I wanted you to, to talk a little bit about the, the other piece of the puzzle, um, scaling a business um, because of to capital. Uh, the company has uh, so far 65 million and, and just 30 million a couple weeks ago in your Series B. Um, and certainly made some headlines because it was led by a, a large firm globally, uh, namely Goldman Sachs. So I'd love you to just talk a little bit about your fundraising journey. Um, what was difficult, but also was it the story or the numbers that really seemed to resonate with investors? How did you find those investors? And what sort of systems and processes did you have to put in place in the company um, to attract investors like Goldman Sachs? Uh, I think a lot of startups are, are still starting their journey and, and systems like governance are, are still quite new to them. And were those investors that supported you on your early journey, were they, were they local, were they international? I'd love you to just chat a little bit about that. Thank you so much, Lexi. And I think, uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll let you the, uh, the journey from the very beginning, because I think at times, you know, when you kind of catch a fundraising journey in midstream, uh, you may lose some of uh, the lessons from, uh, from the early days. Uh, so just to, just to give context, you know, when we started Trigger six years ago, uh, or close actually to seven years ago, you know, raising capital locally was, uh, was very, very tough. And, uh, and I remember then working in Coca-Cola, I basically had to finance 100% uh, of uh, Twiggy's operations in the early days. So, and, uh, and, and it's tough. Uh, and let, me, let me also just highlight that, you know, at times you kind of look at the tail end of a process and the journey that we've had to walk, for example, my wife and I, we had to sell our matrimonial home just to uh, ensure that uh, Piggy was uh, financed and we kept the dream alive, even as we we're going from uh, office to office, trying to raise uh, funds. So that was a very, very tough time. But then because of the amount of investment and the faith that we had shown in the business, I mean, we had put in a lot of skin in the game. It gave investors a lot of confidence that, you know what, if somebody were to invest this amount of capital based on this vision, which seems to be a very uh, compelling vision, I think this is a company worth investing in. So what you find is that uh, the early investors that we had in, in Twiga came on board because uh, there was a significant amount of money already invested by myself as a founder and also with uh, grants being there to manage a business on a day-to-day -day basis. And the second thing was uh, we had managed to put together a decent amount of capability around the table because at times you can have a vision, you can have a strategy. If you don't have the right capability around the table, it then also compromises uh, your ability to execute or it's actually a huge dampener on the story that you're trying to sell. So, and taking it from there, so when you have the early investors, the early investors fall in love with the idea, they fall in love with the vision. And then as you move along, the investors start seeking execution. They start seeking results. So what have you been able to deliver? Yes, you've sold us the vision. You've sold us this dream. What have you been able to execute? And what happens is that uh, at that point, you know, the types of investors started changing, you know, so the earlier investors were very impact oriented. And now we started getting to more and more commercial investors as we moved uh, uh, down, down the road. And uh, last year, as I was transitioning on to, uh, to Twiga, uh, I think the company had gotten to a point where it was no longer now about selling the vision, but it was about also executing. And I had to make a tough career choice. Uh, just to let you know, you know, I was I was in a fairly senior position in uh, in uh, in uh, Coca Cola, and my next role was going to be in uh, in Atlanta. You know, heading up one of the uh, big businesses there, and I had to make a choice. You know, do I pursue that or do I then take on this business that I founded and take it to its logical conclusion? And having made that choice, it also created a lot of confidence in the investor community because, in their view. They looked at it from a perspective of, you know what, you had a comfortable life where everything was guaranteed in a corporate, in a large corporate, but you've taken this faith, uh, this leap of faith to, to more or less uh, be the CEO of this startup that is still in its kind of nascent stages. And that's then what brought in the likes of Goldman Sachs because they looked at the opportunity, they looked at the capability of the management team, including myself now on a full-time basis, 
And they also looked at the level of governance in the company. And I think it is important to outline that integrity is very, very important. At times, it's not something that people think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but you need to think about how you restructure your process and all and ensure that there's that level of integrity. Just to let you know, for us to qualify for the Goldman Sachs investment, we had to, we had to get audited under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which means that you have to then uh, have a clean bill of health as far as that is concerned. Second thing is that you also have to have a clean bill of health as far as the UK Anti-Bribery Act is concerned. And after all that is when people then feel comfortable to then say, okay, fine, I think this is an investment worth making. And that's essentially how we've managed to attract uh, the larger investors that you see on our cup table today. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Has, has Goldman Sachs actually come to, uh, to the continent to visit your office and meet your people? Yes, of course. Was as part of, of due diligence, they have to do that. So we spent a lot of time uh, with them in the company, in the market. So they got to really, really understand the, the company. I mean, they're fairly sharp guys. Uh, so, so the thing is that they will not put their money where they're not confident that they will be able to generate a return. Because as I mentioned, they're very commercial. So, so we spent time in the market. We spent time uh, introducing them to, uh, to our team. They spent time with the team. They spent time with our customers. So they got to have a very, very intimate understanding of how the business runs, which then gave them the comfort to invest. Because this also had to go all the way to the investment committee up in New York. So it means that, you know, the, 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 the management team in Europe had to have a fairly high level of comfort um, to, uh, to then invest uh, in the business. And uh, one thing that I'd love, love to also understand is, is these investors, are they really just looking at your numbers and your success financially as a business? Or are they also looking at the social impact that your business is creating? I think the thing is that uh, impact without uh, a sustainable financial model is kind of uh, a bit shaky because uh, the way I look at it is, uh, you know, today in Africa, if, you, if you're going to make any, uh, any headway in business, so if you're going to solve any big problem, the reality is that your business will have impact. So, and, and let me give you an example. For example, in the case of Nigeria, uh, Nigerians spend about, uh, last time I checked the numbers, Nigerians spend about 60% of their disposable income um, on food and beverage. So, and just to give you context, uh, Kenya, that number is about 55%, so not too different from Nigeria. Uh, if you look at, for example, the US, uh, consumers were spending about 52% uh, of their disposable income on food in the 1870s, that's about 150 years ago. If you look at the numbers today, consumers are spending about 10%, which means that they now have 90% of their disposable income to spend on other stuff. And you can see that other stuff when you look at the US economy. You can see it in terms of retail, you can see it in terms of lifestyle. So it's been a significant shift of how people then spend their income or what they're able to spend their income on in those markets. So in Africa, if we're going to then create efficiency in how uh, food is consumed, in how food is delivered, the reality is that we are freeing up disposable income for other segments of the economy then to start benefiting from that. So if we're very good at making a very, very efficient uh, ecosystem around food production and distribution, then the significant impact in terms of people having more money, in, more money in their pockets to then spend on so many other things. And for me, that's how I like to look at the impact that we are creating as Trigger. Because uh, the key thing is that, um, you know, I think there's no better thing than reducing the amount of money somebody is spending on food, or maybe more or less putting out about 70, 80% of their disposable income just to feed themselves. Because when you hear about an average of 60, I'm pretty sure that, you know, all the folks out there in Banana Island spend only maybe 2% of their disposable income on food. Then you get to places, uh, other places, more affluent places in, uh, in, uh, in Lagos. But by the time you're getting to the, to the lower end of a market, there are people who are living hand to mouth, maybe only able to spend 70% of their food, of their disposable income on food. If you reduce that number, 
to 50%, you'd actually have saved somebody's life. You'd have actually maybe enhanced the lifestyle of a family beyond what you can ever fathom. And I think that for me is what I really love about uh, what we do in that the more successful we are as a business, the more impactful we are to the society. And I think the key thing is that uh, finding that congruence between our business model and the impact that we create uh, is one of the things that really excites me about what we do. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Um, so you come from an operating role, but you, uh, we know each other because we were heading Nigeria, the, the West Africa business for Coca-Cola in Lagos. Um, so as you've transitioned from your operating role to running Twiga full time as an entrepreneur, how have you worked on your own skill set and, and where do you think those gaps were to, to be able to stay relevant in an ever changing market and also scale the business to where it is today? No, thanks. Thanks for that. So the key thing is that Coca-Cola is a company that's been around uh, for 134 years, going to 135 years now, next year. Um, so fairly well established, well respected, generates a lot of cash. So it's a very, very stable uh, business. Uh, running a business like Coca-Cola is very, very different because the systems and processes have been tried and tested. There's a lot of governance. There's a lot going on in such an organization. So, um, and, uh, and the thing is that you make the transition thinking that, okay, fine, I have all this knowledge that I have from Coca-Cola, it's gonna be a cut and paste. You even carry some files across just to then say, hey, you know what, I don't wanna reinvent the wheel. And then uh, what you realize is that uh, when you're in a, a startup environment, it's very, very different from, uh, from, uh, from a Coca-Cola. Because the thing is that, um, everything just doesn't exist and has to be built from scratch. And you take it for granted when you run something built vis-a-vis -vis something that needs to be built. So, and there's this, uh, what I call a, an entrepreneur's curve. Uh, and, and I also had to go through it, uh, albeit in a more mild way, but it was also important. So what happens first is that you come in and your confidence is right up here. And, uh, and the key thing is that, you know, you've got great ideas. This is what I'm going to do. I have a 30-day, 60-day, 90-day plan. And then the things that uh, you think you were going to do then don't work. And uh, to some extent, then you start losing confidence quietly. <laughs> Where you're like, you know what? I don't want to say this loudly unless I can spook investors and, and spook lots of folks. But I need to just be very, very quiet. And, and the key thing is that you're trying to figure out stuff. And you continue losing your confidence until, you know, there's that line which uh, denotes a zero. And then uh, you dig a bit uh, and, and you actually go below zero. And, and that bit I call the trough of sorrow, <laughs> where you're trying a lot of things, but many things don't seem to be working. And you're trying to figure out, you know, how do I scale this business? How do I get the growth going again? And you start figuring out little things that uh, start working. And over time, you start building your confidence. But the key thing that I always advise people is that don't stay in the trough of sorrow for too long because then you start having problems with your investors. But as I came out of that trough, I started becoming more and more confident of what it is that I needed to do in uh, Trigger to make Trigger a success. And, and I'm happy to know that, you know, from when uh, we started, uh, when I started out as CEO, from where we are today, at least I've managed to grow Trigger's revenue eightfold. So, and I presume that uh, that even within COVID, we still managed to double our revenue between April and now. So, and again, I think that's uh, just a testament to the fact that at times you have to let go of your biases or you have to let go of uh, maybe ways in which you think that consumers uh, want to derive really from your organization to get to a point where you're in tune with your customer, you're in tune with what the business requires, and you're able to provide the leadership that gets you there. What were the first hires that you made at Twiga besides Grant and yourself? In terms of so, so the thing is that, uh, uh, I mean, it was amazing. So uh, Kikonde, who heads up uh, our, our head of operations right now, was a hire we made uh, back in the day. He was amongst our first employees and uh, had never worked in a big uh, role before. 
And at that time, you know, he was helping uh, recruit uh, farmers. And that was, uh, and, and I just look at the growth that he's had over time. He's, he's been amazing. Right now, he's got a team of 200 people underneath him and he's doing an excellent job. Uh, when I look at, uh, for example, our CTO, Kane, um, Kane was already an, a successful entrepreneur. And uh, Grant and I convinced him to, uh, to, to more or less uh, leave his company in the hands of somebody else and join Twigger. And, uh, and today he's leading our, our tech team with a, with a team of close to 50 people uh, under, under tech. And again, very, very impactful. All the technology that we have today has been built internally. And I must say that, you know, in some of these places, you know, we're at the cutting edge. For example, the way we are leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in terms of optimizing our distribution. But when I look at uh, finance, our CFO, Mahir, also joined around the, the same time. And actually, he was working for one of the investors uh, who were then uh, investing in Twigger. And he liked the company so much that we convinced him also to, uh, to come across. And what happened is that that's how we started building this, uh, this team that we have. And what I, what, one thing that I'm a strong believer in is that if you build the capability, um, you know, um, then a lot of uh, people then see that execution ability as something that is investable. It's one thing to tell investors that this is what I can do in the business. It's another thing to do it. And I think the reason why we've been very, very successful as Twigger is because everything we've committed to in terms of investors, you know, we've delivered. Like right now, I would say that uh, like some of our, the projections we give our investors during our Series A in terms of where we want to be in five years, we already weigh above some of those projections. And I think that's uh, that's testament to the fact that, you know, we got right hires very, very early on. And the other thing also is that motivate those early hires to think as entrepreneurs. So if you look at, for example, our first uh, plan, uh, make sure that, you know, all the early managers that we brought on board participated in that, uh, in that ESOP plan. Uh, yesterday, we just announced uh, our ESOP B plan, where we're then going to then look at distributing uh, um, options uh, amounting to about 10% uh, of the exit value of Twigger uh, in the next couple of years. And when you look at all these incentives, it allows you to then attract and retain uh, top talent. And I think that for us is uh, what has really, really worked. And if I look at um, a lot of the top talent that we have today, you know, they came in from those uh, early years. They've stuck with us. And right now we're bringing even more talented people as we start our expansion across Africa. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, it was a, a big choice for you to leave the, the corporate world, or it would seem that way. I mean, it's a nicely paid job. Um, certainly get a lot of perks and of course there's lots of global upside to doing that whether it's in Africa or elsewhere so why would anyone really choose to leave that comfortable life to the journey as an entrepreneur um, and maybe if you can kind of elaborate on some of the top three advice you would give to people looking to leave that corporate world and following your, their dreams of becoming an entrepreneur and what that vision of entrepreneur or success, entrepreneurial success looks like for you on a, on a personal side, that would be excellent. Okay, thanks. So I think the thing is that, uh, first thing I wanna advise everybody, <laughs> entrepreneurship is not for everybody. So, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't believe that you can sell your house, invest in something and then figure it out as you move along, then, um, you know, I wouldn't advise everybody just to, to jump into that space. So, but the key thing is that, you know, I've, uh, I've had a high appetite for risk uh, from uh, very early on. I've tried so many things. But uh, one of the things that I did was, um, you know, when I was at this crossroad, you know, do I then move to North America and, and pursue a career with Coca-Cola? And the thing is that, you know, um, if, if I was looking at my own success, uh, as an individual, I think that's a very, very easy decision to make. You know, you know, chances are you'll be living in a nice suburb, uh, you know, clean area, uh, lots of trees, um, kids going to private uh, private school. So that's 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 an exciting. That's actually it's a safe option 
but it's a comfortable option, you know, but you will not build a legacy for yourself uh, because everybody will remember that, uh, you know, uh, all Peter did was uh, sell sugary water to lots of folks. <laughs> and, uh, and that was it. And then there's this other portion where, you know, you've, uh, you've more or less uh, had the best exposure you'd ever get from, uh, from a company in terms of development, in terms of growth in uh, mindset, how you view business, um, how you view industry. And what I say is that if I can't improve, where I come from, if I can't improve Africa by virtue of creating a more efficient industry, then I'm also being very selfish with uh, the skills and the knowledge that I've acquired over the last couple of years. And, and for me, then it was important to then say that, yeah, success is important or comfort is important. But if I give up that comfort, can I have a bigger impact on society? And that's the way I kind of look at my current role in Twigger. You know, today we employ a thousand people. Uh, if there was not Twigger, there would be a thousand people who would not have a role today, or who now would have a job today. When I look at uh, farmers, you know, we're in the middle of uh, creating uh, an ecosystem of commercial production of farmers for the domestic market. Just to give you an example, uh, two years ago, all our farming was smallholder driven, rain fed agriculture. Today, we have 14,000 acres of contracted irrigated land. So, and when you look at that differential, things are now we can have more productivity, more efficiency into that food ecosystem. If there was not Twigger, we'd not have that ecosystem being developed right now. Uh, farmers have been having a hard issue, a, a tough issue accessing financing. When I look at, for example, some of the things that we've been able to do with uh, IFC, uh, recently we just launched a $30 million farmer financing initiative. Again, that goes to improving the capacity and capability of local farmers and ensuring that we can uh, modernize food production on the continent. Again, that was not there if uh, we didn't have uh, Twigger. So when I look at all this, I'm like, you know what? I think it was worth it giving up those comforts uh, to, uh, to looking at uh, a more meaningful existence where I can have a larger impact uh, in Africa and in the, in, the, in, the, in the sustainability of the continent. played a very active role as uh, both a mentor and leading the ecosystem in entrepreneurial leadership development. Um, you're a member, a board member of Endeavor in Kenya, uh, for example, and even though you're quite busy, why do you think that it's important for you to commit your time to mentoring and organizations like Endeavor? Um, and what do you think that does for the ecosystems and you personally? First thing is that uh, I do it because it aligns with my personal beliefs. I think that's the first thing that, uh, that I would say about Endeavor. And the reason I say that is um, I believe that, you know, entrepreneurship uh, has the solutions to a lot of the problems that we face in the world. You know, be it food security, be it technology, be it efficiency, be it productivity, health, transportation, wellness, uh, all this are areas that uh, you'll find that uh, unless we have entrepreneurs uh, falling in love with those problems and trying to solve them, uh, then we would have uh, a less sustainable world uh, in the future. And, and that, that's, that's the first thing that I strongly believe that is in the impact of entrepreneurship in the world today. The second thing is around nurturing the ecosystem. You know, when, uh, when we started out as, uh, as Twigger, it's very, very difficult to get financing. Um, this whole issue around venture capital wasn't uh, well established or the concept of venture capital wasn't well established within the ecosystem. Uh, I mean, just to give you an example, when Grant and I received our first term sheet, we taught to ourselves everything about uh, venture capital on the Y Combinator Google site. And, uh, oh no, the, the YouTube site for Y Combinator. And that's what we learned about, uh, about some of these things. So. So the key thing is that then, how do we then create an ecosystem where we then rally more people around, uh, you know, investing in, uh, in local, local businesses? And also what type of uh, assistance can we then give these uh, local businesses? Uh, just to give you an example, uh, when I look at uh, the earlier 
members of an, the endeavor, the earlier entrepreneurs of endeavor, when you look at those businesses, I mean, you know, employing 3,000, 4,000 people, having about uh, 300 to 400 million dollars of uh, annual revenue. And this is a huge, huge uh, impact in terms of ecosystem. And if you can identify more of those companies and then figure out what can we do to improve uh, the execution capacity and capability of these institutions, to even make them bigger, to make them billion dollar businesses that would have significant impact. Uh, and that's when you start, start looking at some of the things that Endeavor does for entrepreneurs. You know, from uh, from mentorship to programs that um, that improve uh, uh, the relevance of, for example, leaders. And I look at myself, right? Having come from Coca Cola, I'm also an Endeavor entrepreneur, but also sit on the board. So, but when I look at, uh, for example, uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, four months, I've attended a, a leadership development program in Harvard that was uh, sponsored by Endeavor. Uh, I had a mentorship session with uh, one of uh, the ex uh, senior vice presidents on Amazon, just in terms of my my business and how to think about my business model. And when you look at all these things, it's about empowering entrepreneurs to be the best that they can be. And I think that's something that I'm just so passionate about. And now we want to figure out how we can even get more companies feeding into that pipeline where we can then create uh, an even greater ecosystem of uh, entrepreneurs who believe that they, it is within their wherewithal to change the world. Um, Peter, if you had uh, it to do over, um, let's say Twiga is already on and running as a very successful business, or maybe you've even exited the business. If you had one venture to focus your time on, on a new venture, um, what would that look like? What would you be doing now in the, the market? What what problems do you think really need to be solved? Well, I think the thing is that, uh, I mean, the food space is very interesting. The reason why I say the food space is interesting is uh, I'm a big believer of fish for the future. <laughs> so if 50% of consumer spend is in food, then, I mean, you don't need to do a lot of analytics to tell you that that's where the largest opportunity lies. And all you need to do is figure out, you know, Either you, and the key thing also is, you know, leveraging technology. And technology could meet from different angles. What is it that you can then do to uh, make a difference in this food space? Uh, let me just give you an example, like an uh, interesting uh, business that I, I encountered some time back and we're working together right now. A company by APL Sciences, the name of APL Sciences, where they figured out how to uh, uh, use a, uh, uh, organic matter or food food matter and create protective barriers that uh, slow down the oxidation of uh, fruit and veg, which means that you slow down the ripening process in something that is edible and uh, and very, very, uh, uh, very, very non-toxic. Um, and the key thing is that think about what that does. Think about a market like Nigeria. If you can uh, um, use this to process the, the, the tomatoes that are coming from the north, you know, from Jos, from Kano, and uh, getting them out to uh, Lagos um, without need for refrigeration. And then you get all the potatoes intact. I mean, just think about what impact that will have. So I think that there's so much that you can then do with uh, technology in the food space. And of course, uh, there's so much you can then do in terms of uh, transport, health, I mean, there's a company right now that we're working with um, in the health space, uh, mainly with our retailers. And uh, we just gave them uh, an opportunity to pilot in one area. And this is like uh, a clinic on wheels. Uh, think about uh, a clinic on Anokada in uh, Lagos, where if you fall sick, they come to you. They're able to even do basic tests, uh, get the test results uh, right there and get your medication. It's like a moving little clinic. And, uh, and the thing is that we've had a conversion rate of over 90%. Or if you think about things like uh, insurance, uh, right now we're working with a micro insurance uh, company where we develop, we've developed a product around uh, income protection. Because if you're an informal trader, when you fall sick and you're not able to go to your shop, uh, that's loss of income, that's loss of working capital. So what if you're to create a product that protects 
the retailer from such an eventuality that even when I fall sick, um, I can still uh, get my business going, that I can go the next day without missing a bit. So there's just so much that you can do in this space. And when I look at Africa, there's just so many problems that are just waiting for an innovation to happen. And, and just leveraging technology creates a very, very exciting space um, for us to just do so many amazing things. Yeah, one interesting thing that I can pull out of what you just said is it sounds like Twiga is also working with a lot of other providers as partners and, and kind of helping build this broader platform that itself adds additional services on. Um, and each of those services themselves is a whole other business model, but you know the ecosystem kind of fits together into a, a puzzle and helps support each other. Yeah, no, definitely. The way we see ourselves is that uh, we're a B2B e-commerce company and we want to be the one-stop shop for informal retail. So just to, just for example, you know, right now uh, we have a, a fintech product, again, integrated through our platform, where we're looking at uh, giving uh, uh, retailers uh, seven days uh, credit, interest-free, um, which means that, you know, if you maintain your credit rating, you can then uh, buy goods from us and you pay after seven days, uh, paying no interest. And again, you know, it's innovative products like that that also allow you to start disrupting the financial services uh, space where maybe people are used to doing micro lending at exorbitant interest rates. So why not just do it at no interest rate if a customer is going to buy goods from you anyways? Um, or uh, is it about uh, providing insurance services off a platform? So the way we see ourselves is that we have a captive audience with... Uh, with the informal retail. And as long as we have the captive audience, the key thing for us is that how do we then leverage technology to provide more and more services uh, to this informal retail to a point where once they get onto our app, they can then get everything that they need from financial services, from insurance, from health services, um, and all the way to goods and services, which are very, very integral to their daily life. So we wanna be that one-stop shop for the informal retail. And of course, this is not services that we provide, but we're an aggregator. We bring in people who offer those products and then we democratize uh, those products across our supply chain. Um, on the importance of technology, I think we see a lot in a lot of markets, uh, even if it's a technology company, a lot of the work they have to do is still very much analog. Um, but specific to Twiga, I'd really like to understand some of the use cases and applications that AI is being, how AI is being used within Twiga to really optimize uh, the company. Um, you'd mentioned optimizing distribution, and are there any other? I would say that uh, the biggest one is around uh, distribution. Why is this the case? Because of the challenges that, uh, that we face. So let me give you an example. Uh, you can have a, go a road on Google Maps showing up today that, uh, by the way, this road is the shortest path between this joint and this joint. And then what happens is that the municipality just digs it up overnight. So, and, uh, and, and the key thing is that, you know, you're kind of left in the situation where you're like, okay, uh, now I was here yesterday, but now I have to use a different route. So again, what you're finding is that, uh, if you use technology in a very, very static way, uh, especially when it comes to distribution, because essentially you're learning how to, uh, to distribute in the nook and crannies of this informal, uh, informal retail markets. I mean, some places, you know, uh, I mean, if you have a truck just parked, you know, it just creates darkness because there isn't any other light that's permeating through the street. So these are the little nooks and crannies you have to then learn how to navigate. And as you're navigating that, you need to have a system that's constantly learning. And the key thing is that, you know, you're looking at it from the perspective of, um, you know, as people are ordering, how clustered are the customers who ordered from us today? What is the weight of product that they ordered? What is the volume of product that they ordered from us today? What is the state of the road in the place where that shop is located? And what is the potential for traffic in that location? And when you take all this, what you want to do is get to a situation where you can optimize your cost of a drop. Because if you're not able to optimize the cost for a drop, 
Third party, you know, last mile logistics can easily run away in terms of uh, cost and actually eat up your unit economics. So for us, that's an area where we need an intelligence system that will continuously learn as the cities change, as the dynamics in the local markets change, then you can change with it and ensure that you're being very, very, very uh, conscious about uh, how you build that. Let me give you an example. You might find that maybe the, 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 the distance between uh, two shops that you're making a drop is very, very high, but you realize that there's a certain unique product that is sold by all the shops that sit in the middle between these two locations. So if you have localized discounting of that product, then it means that now all of a sudden the truck is able to stop in all those shops and that starts reducing your cost to serve. So it's, an, it's a continuous way in which you optimize, uh, you optimize cost. And, and that's basically uh, one of the biggest use cases that we have. It doesn't show up on the, consumer, on the customer side because for them, you know, a truck just stops outside and drops product. But for us to do that in an economic way uh, requires analytics around a lot of data. And just to give you an example, uh, right now, if I look at our database, we have about 25 million records since we started Trigger. But uh, right now, we're generating a million records a month. And this shows you exponentially how the data that we're generating and how we're consuming it has just grown. Um. I'd like to take it back a little bit more to the, the fundraising journey and, and the ecosystem. And maybe I can weigh into this a little bit as well. Um, so I've been out in Nigeria for about eight years and I'm doing in venture related investments for over five. And I've seen a huge amount of change in the ecosystem where international parties are really getting involved and looking at this market as, you know, the, the next big emerging market to, to really make waves in, in venture. Um, but I'd love to hear from you a little bit more about how you see, uh, at, if you have a choice as an entrepreneur, um, bringing in local investors versus international investors and how to balance each of those parties and, and which one provides more value or less value or maybe different sorts of value um, and how you've thought about that through building Twiga and, and raising capital along the way. Well, I think the thing is that um, our, our local investors, what you find is that actually there is, a lot of, uh, there is a lot of capital that exists in our local markets. So, I mean, that's so our local markets. No, they don't invest by because of lack of capital. Just to give you an example, if I look at the pension industry in Kenya, they're more or less sitting on about $14 billion uh, of, uh, of liquid assets. But what you find is that uh, they will still be very, very uh, focused on traditional investments. You know, let's buy a piece of land and build a plot, or let's buy a piece of land and buy a skyscraper. And what you find is that, like now, for example, five years ago, the government made an exit to say, oh, by the way, you now need to look, you can now allocate, maybe I think it was 10% of your portfolio, maybe 5% of your portfolio to private equity. And it took a very long time for, for many years, nothing happened. And they just like mainly just drips and drops uh, going into that space. So what you find is that, you know, the local markets still don't understand how you create value from financing this uh, elite stage startups. But the thing is that um, there's, there's cases of exit on the continent that are starting to create proof points that these are actually viable investments. DPO earlier in the year, you know, when you had uh, uh, close to a $300 million uh, uh, deal uh, that was at multiples of revenue. I mean, that starts creating excitement in the local market. You know, well, what Shola did with uh, Paystack in uh, Nigeria, $200 million uh, buyout uh, by Stripe. I mean, all this then start creating that confidence that by the way, even for the local investment space, uh, there is value in investing in these local startups. And the key thing is that they could generate much, much higher returns than anything you'd ever invest locally. And I think it will be a blend. It will be a blend between international and local capital because at the end of the day also, uh, by having international capital and local capital and blending, it also allows you to then have a lot of value discovery uh, as you move along. 
because again, reliance on one type of uh, source of funds uh, also then makes brings challenges, especially around value discovery for the entrepreneur. Because one of the things that's really motivating for entrepreneurs is to know that you can raise capital and you can still have a meaningful stake in your business going forward to a point where you have exit. So again, that journey is very, very important. So I think it's it's something that will improve. I mean, in Nigeria, if you just look at the banks and you look at the, um, I don't know too much about the pension uh, industry, but I know that, you know, if you just look at the banks, if they were to then think about uh, maybe the startup ecosystem being uh, an asset class that they can invest in, I mean, think about the real estate. If you go to VI, I think most of the real estate is owned by the branches of various banks because you have a GT bank, then you have the next bank, Access Bank, and, and it's like that for the whole place. But if you're to then say that, you know what, if you're to then invest in technology and all this real estate, if you're to liquidate it and uh, divert that money into the, uh, into, the, into the startup ecosystem, how much more value will you generate compared to the capital gains that you will get uh, in the local market? And then also using uh, hubs. For example, you find that you can use Kenya as a hub to actually expand into the local, uh, into the local, in the regional market. You can use Nigeria as a hub to expand into the local market. So you realize that, for example, in the case of Paystack, there are multiple markets and, and more and more successful ventures are actually starting to look more regional. And that starts giving you diversification of your capital. If you're invested fully in Nigeria, it means you're 100% exposed to the ups and downs of an era. But once you start then moving out, and it means that you also, um, optimizing your forex risk. So I think the thing is that there's a lot of education that needs to happen in the local market. But I think the proof points that we're starting to see in exits are starting to cre create that believability um, in terms of attracting local capital. Yeah, I definitely think so as well. Um, I mean, I think that you'll see local capital becoming, and local capital meaning local venture firms becoming more niche focused uh, and probably moving a little bit earlier stage um, because they are local and can see the founders quite early in their, in their growth trajectory and also add a lot more value, I think, on the business development side or because they understand and know the local market. Um, but also that they'll specialize much more in something specific. Uh, for example, we're focusing on supporting our entrepreneurs with a, a science team. And you might other parties look to do that maybe on the financial side or the legal side. Um, and then in the later stages, really attracting those global investors to really scale up with cheaper capital, I would say, uh, as they expand across the continent and probably into other emerging markets. Um, uh, one, one question also from uh, the audience from Malojo. Um What other entrepreneurs that have scaled their business across Africa do you most admire? And I might expand that to maybe global entrepreneurs um, that have also been on that journey. And what founders or companies are you most excited about, um, aside from Twiga, of course? Well, I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot to learn from uh, from. Uh... From, uh, from, uh, from different uh, players in different markets. I think uh, for me, one of the things, uh, for, and let's, let's put it this way, I think in the local, uh, in, the, in the African space, um, I think Shola has been a, a real inspiration in terms of uh, building a very, very high value business uh, with uh, very, very minimal uh, capital. Um, and, and I think that for me was, uh, was a real inspiration in terms of, uh, how he, uh, he managed to uh, pull that off and create the value that he did. And the thing is that uh, there's, uh, there's many others uh, out there. Um, for example, there's, uh, there's my good friend, uh, uh, Obi from, uh, from Kobo360. Um, he's, uh, he's also been very, very uh, energetic in terms of how he's just built, uh, built his business. Um, and, and I'm very excited about Kobo. Because uh, even in the early stages, I I invested as a as a uh, as an angel, and because I was also very very excited about uh, just his uh, grit and, and how his I mean you know you go out there you're in Kano and uh, and you're spending your whole time there trying to figure out uh, how to create value. Um, I mean, and then there's other international entrepreneurs. For example, there's a gentleman by the name of James, who's, the, who's actually the founder of APL Sciences, 
a lot into that biotech space in food. So I must say that, you know, what really inspires me is people who are taking technology and redefining uh, traditional industries and generating a lot of value. So I think our session is ending, but um, one last question that I was left with that maybe I'll have time for you to answer, but maybe we'll have to follow up with another catalyzing conversations is what is the future of Twiga? Uh, how are you thinking about the company going forward? Are you planning on an exit or do you think that this is something that uh, individually can grow out in the ecosystem and maybe even become a listed company? Well, I think there's always uh, two parts and it also depends on the patience of money that you have on your cap table. So, uh, and I think for us uh, in the long term, there could be uh, different parts. Uh, we could have a, a strategic uh, investor um, coming in trigger down the road. That's one path, which means that you more or less uh, take the private uh, route or the other path is uh, being a public, uh, being going for a listing and, and being a public entity, which again create, creates a, a liquidity opportunity for the investors that you have on your cap table. Um, so I think those are the two paths that I would see uh, down the road. Uh, but of course, the most important thing right now is, you know, create the value that creates that to be an opportunity, a realizable opportunity. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Peter. I really enjoyed this conversation um, and hopefully we can do it again. Thank you so much.